weaknesses. Our weaknesses, you know, one of the big things I think the weakness is technology. Uh, Wayne sort of hit that, the fact that we live in, a, in an island a little bit. Um, it's tough. We need to make sure that we can get the technology. I hear we have whiteboards. They're great. We, um, I heard a little bit of the board meetings, the fact that they're not running well right at the beginning. We need to make sure that those things happen, that the teachers have all that um, technology, have, have the, the ready to go in the morning, ready to go all the time. Um, it's tough because, you know, we live in a place that doesn't have fiber optics, <laughs> um, where all the other school districts have. Um, so those are some of the tech, some of the things that we need to work on as a board member. See what we can keep on going. And you know it's time. Next question. In other professions, a master achieves journeyman status. What do you feel are the positives and the negatives to teachers achieving tenure? Can you say that one more time, Tim, please? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes, sir. In other professions, a master achieves journeyman status. What do you feel are the positives and neg negatives? to teachers achieving tenure? Um, well, obviously, right off the bat, and I cannot, you know, with my job, with what I do um, in relationship to, to the teachers, you know, as you go through years, you become better at that, better to do your job, obviously. Um, I think that, um, that's a good thing. I mean, it, it's tough. You talk about trying to get teachers here, and they have to go through this whole process of tenure, learning the system. Once they do, you want to keep them here. Um, they have the tenure. Um, I think that we, you want them to keep keep growing. You want them to get get through their, their some of the things that they have to do to keep their master to keep learning. Some of the technology that they're going on through the schools is one thing. Um, I think that tenure's good. The downside to tenure, and I know that this is one of those things that a board member has to look at, or anybody in the community has to look at. What happens when a teacher, 20 years, 25 years down the road, they still lose their, their you know, not their ability, but their, their umph for teaching. You know, we have our umph in business, in, in painting, of which I do. You know, sometimes it just, you know, so sometimes tenure is good. Most times it's good. Sometimes it gets a little bit, you know, what do you do? How do you get through that? As a board member, you just got to look at it case by case. Based on base, I mean, it's just it's one of those processes, that a board, one of those tough things that a board member has to look at. It is tough. It's very tough. You know, I don't see too much of that in our district. And over the years, um, I have not seen very too much of that. So, anyway, thank you. That's my okay. Um, honestly, I don't know a lot about tenure. Um, not being involved in school as these two gentlemen are. Uh, of course, it's, it's job security, I guess, once you reach your tenure, and that's a great thing. Um, hopefully, you don't, you know, slack off because you think, okay, I've reached it, now I'm good. Um, oh boy. 
You know, I, I honestly, until I get more into this, I really, I, that's about as best as I can give you because I really don't know enough about it. I, yeah, I, I, tenure is, is a reward. And it's, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recognition of achievement. Uh, it's one thing to get your teaching credential. It's one thing to teach for a number of years. But I think tenure, to me, is a recognition of, of really achieving excellence. Uh, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't end there. It, it, it's something that uh, should be rewarded throughout a teacher's career. If, if there's a tendency, and, and I, I agree, I don't see it happening here. If there's a tendency for some teachers, you know, when they get later on in their career to uh, slack off a little bit, then, uh, then I think it needs to be looked at, first of all, from the standpoint of what's happening with that individual. Uh, is there something going on that could be addressed? That's not the board's responsibility. I think that, that first is the responsibility of the principals, the responsibility of the superintendent of schools. You know, I think the board's responsibility is to set up a system uh, that is clear, recognizable, uh, easily understood, agreed to by everyone, and then really it's up to, it's up to the uh, administration to implement that. If there are problems that, that result, if, if there are problems with the tenure process that's being, uh, that can be identified, uh, then uh, the board, as a, as, a, as a group, needs to look at the policies that re regulate tenure and make decisions on, on the basis of that. But I really, uh, I as a board member would be very reluctant to get involved in an individual situation, an individual teacher situation, because that's really the responsibility of the administration, the principals and the uh, superintendent. Mr. Warren, next question. We hear volumes about teachers. How do you view the classified staff and the importance of their role in our schools? Okay, and uh, Casey, you get to go first. Well, once again, these are tough questions for someone who's not involved in the school that much. And um, can, can you just repeat it one more time, please? Can I hear it again? We hear volumes about teachers. How do you view the classified staff and the importance of their role at our schools? <clears throat> I mean, pretty much all, all the staff is important, classified. Um, I really honestly don't know how to answer that question. I'm sorry, but I don't. Okay. Wait a second. Uh, you know, this kind of touches on something that I've, I've experienced in my own career in state parks. Uh, uh, I was a ranger for 10 years before I became an uh, environmental scientist, and uh, during that time, uh, ran rangers had just recently split off from the rest of the employees, so, you know, maintenance workers and so on. It used to be all people doing one job, and then in the late 60s, early 70s, that split happened, and rangers became one class of employees. Maintenance workers became another class, and I saw a huge problem with that. Huge division between the two, rivalries, uh, jealousies. Uh, the problem was they were being treated differently by, by the state. And I think the important thing with the classified staff is for, for everyone to realize that they have as much contact with the students as the teachers do. Uh, they have more, in some cases, more one-to-one -one contact with the students. They aren't teaching classes, they're out there talking to the individuals, dealing with the individuals in, in the offices, out in the playgrounds, uh, and, the, and the fields themselves. So they have a lot of one-to-one -one contact. Their job as, as uh, a role model for the students, as a, uh, a leader for the students is, is, is critical. And, and you know, my understanding in this district is that there's been a lot of effort made to, to keep both uh, 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 class classifications uh, on an equal footing. And I think that's commendable and should be kept that way. Um, to the nuts and bolts of the school district, they are. Um, I, for myself, when I come on campus, boy, you want to be friends with that secretary. <laughs> I am not kidding. Um, I, <laughs> That's how I've gotten away with some of the things I do. I mean, I'll come in here and Pam Peterson. Um, it, it, 
really. Um, that is it. Our, I'm sorry, Karen. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Bowman, sorry. Um, the only one was Darla. Darla was tough. <laughs> but um, they're the nuts and bolts. It's a huge thing for, for you, you hit it on the head, Dwayne. They're the ones out there who see our kids every single day. They're the ones who are, I can't tell you how many times my youngest daughter would come home and say good things and bad things. <laughs> um, you know, and it's, it, it's huge. It, they remember, they remember the teachers dearly. They do. They do remember Melissa Francis who's here. Um, a real bright spot to Kim. Um, so it's a huge, it's huge. And uh, we should treat them just as n nothing different from what with the teachers. Um, like I said, I believe with the nuts and bolts of this district and any other district. So, thank you. Mr. Hicks has the next question. The ability to communicate with others, including those you disagree with, is an essential skill for board members. How would you describe your skill in this area? And please give some examples. And Lane, you go first. This time. Can I make up some examples? I, you know, I've worked for State Parks for 35 years. Uh, I've been in this district for 25 of those years. Uh, I've seen a huge turnover in staff in that time. I've had four or five different bosses during that period. I've got along with most of them well. Uh, I didn't get along with any of them totally well. Uh, we always have had differences, uh, but I've always had a respectful relationship with them and, I, and I've always expected the same thing from them, that they would have a respectful relationship with me. In my responsibilities at the, at, uh, in the district now uh, include employing sometimes up to 13 people. And uh, they all either directly or indirectly respond, report to me. I've had to deal with their differences, their, their differences of opinion among themselves. I've had to deal with their differences of opinions with me. But the important thing is, is that uh, we always have to maintain an attitude of respect. You know, probably the, 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 the hardest time I ever had was with one employee who uh, I was acting as su his supervisor for a very brief period of time. Uh, I had to call him into the office and tell him that he was not treating his fellow employees, actually his subordinates, uh, at all well. He had to, to clean up his act and, and uh, not continue with that type of behavior that was totally inappropriate. And I've worked with this guy for a long, long time in another capacity, uh, and we were, we were good friends, and he listened and nodded, and I finished, and he said, you realize I've heard all this before, don't you? <laughs> so I had to go back to square one and say, I don't care if you've heard it all before. You've got to stop treating your employees the way you do. Um, so, and I, I hope that this was the I forget about this time thing. Um, I coach. I coached the high school for 13 years. I coached up here for, well, when the school, after my 13 years, when the school started in Michelson. Um, I have learned to curb my passion. I have a rep here too, so I have to really be careful with it. Um, I, ha I have been to numerous board meetings, from the Lice issue, to Feeney Park, to the, the track, to numerous items. I can't even, I can't, when's, the board, when's the board meetings faithfully being on that side? Um, I'm, again, I'm not going to lie, I'm a very passionate man. I have learned to curb that. Um, I believe in the chain of command. 
I believe, and because of my coaching and my job, I believe the, fact, the chain of command. I believe that if a parent comes to me, that we take, instead of just coming to the board member, we need to go to the person that the teacher, the administrator, we should be the last line. Um, the, the disagreement, I've had disagreements with probably almost everybody here. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to lie. I have. I've got friends here that I've had disagreements with. There's, those are some of the decisions you have to make. You know, I try to be a likable guy. I listen to problems. I listen to what people have to say. I love listening to what people have to say. I try to guide them into where they need to go. Whether I agree or not, and a lot of times I don't, a lot of times I do. I try to listen, I try to make sure that I give the best advice that I can, or steer them to that advice. Um, so, I, uh, this is sort of an interesting question because I am, you know, my job today, my job today, I mean every day I deal with um, what colors do I put on the wall? Or if I agree or disagree, I got slammed today on a job, not by my fault, but she just didn't like it. You know, and you have to just bite the bullet. And, mm -hmm. Okay. So those are some of the some of the things as we as as through the commu the community that um, I've learned to deal with when a younger man to now an older gentleman. <laughs> okay, well, this is a question I can answer. <laughs> um, communication is, is very important. Um, I've been, I've done a lot of customer service uh, at a, a business I had before. Um, I was the one who dealt with the employees. Um, I've done some things with the Humane Society and put on a big event and everyone came to me and asked me for advice and I directed people. Uh, and and I'm, I know people, I'm a good talker, um, I'm very personable and people don't seem to have a problem coming to me to, have question, to ask me questions, have questions answered that I know the answer to, hopefully. Um, so communication is a, a real good thing for me if, if I know what I'm talking about. How do you feel about NCLB, No Child Left Behind? And is there too much teaching to the test? To the test? And is there too much what? Let me read that again. How do you yes. feel about NCLB, No Child Left Behind? And is there too much teaching to the test? Okay. Wait. Okay, this is one of those things that probably people didn't like me. Um, one of those, it was way back when, when they, I would say it first started, but the test was coming out. Um, I said, whoa, I was at the board with, whoa, are we teaching to the test? Oh, no, Clayton, no, 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 big taboo. And, and I, I, I'm having a big problem with this with the No Child Left Behind, with, because that's how our schools get evaluated, is the test. Um, you know, I'm not saying our school does it. I don't know. I don't know if the teachers are teaching the test. We don't know. They have a curriculum. They, they go about their business. But, but, no matter how you look at it, we still are looking at if we don't do well at that test, we're not looking very good. If we don't look very good, then our monies and all these other things kick, click in. So, do I believe in it? I probably have to say no. I mean, I really have a hard time. I'd rather let those teachers do their job. Do what they have to do. Don't have somebody behind us saying, you know, this is what you need to do. You need to teach these kids. This is if they're good teachers, they're going to do it. Um, it's just too bad that we have labeled and have to label all this 
you know, with a test. <coughs> that the administration walks around here all crying. It's, it's test week. Because I'm going to tell you, that week when our kids come home, it's it hell. It is. Make sure they eat right. Make sure they do this. Make sure they do that. That's a terrible situation. That's a terrible situation that we have to put on our kids to make our schools feel that they're doing Our schools are doing a good job. Our schools are doing a great job. Why do we need a test to show that? So I, yeah, yeah, I have a hard time with it. So, thank you. Okay. Casey, you're next. <sighs> okay. Um, I know a little bit about this, um, but really not enough. And, and again, this is something that I will need to learn as time goes on. Um, not having children in school who go through these tests, I'm really not aware of, of it that much. Um, so I, I hate to comment on something I don't know enough, but I'd like to learn more about. I, I'm not a big fan of No Child Left Behind. I think it was a mistake, um, but it's, it is reality, and it's not going to go away. So you know, we, can, we can either complain about it and uh, uh, wring our hands, or we just deal with it. And I think that's what schools have been doing. I don't think they've been teaching, any of you have been teaching to the test. I think you've been teaching to the state standards that reflect No Child Left Behind. Uh, and, and reflect the information that's covered on the test. And again, that's, that's, that's just the, the name of the game. My biggest complaint about No Child Left Behind, aside from the fact that it's a federally mandated program, which I'm not in favor of, uh, my biggest complaint is that it has redirected the focus of education away from some other subjects that I think are, are really valuable. Uh, in lower grades, science has pretty much disappeared from the curriculum uh, because it's not covered on the tests. It's not, it's not covered, and so it doesn't have to be taught. Now, that's one of the things that we've tried to accomplish, Wendy and I, with the thematic units that have been created up at Big Trees, where we get some exposure to natural sciences anyway up at the park uh, for all grade levels up through sixth grade. Uh, we, we, we're trying to uh, make use of the park, but we're also doing that through the context of the state standards. So we know that we're meeting the requirements that are imposed upon you, but also giving the opportunity to maybe expand the uh, 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 range of options you have open to you in teaching those. Uh, I, I, I would also like now, and this is my own supposition, Wendy and I have argued about this, my own <coughs> supposition is that you've been teaching to the standards long enough now uh, and this whole system was new to you, you it was kind of thrown at you, I, I, would, I would think that you've gotten used to it enough now that, that it's time to start looking at your own creative approaches and, and going beyond, going out of the box, essentially, with, with the ways you can teach uh, to the standards. And maybe try to, to look at integrating uh, the arts and science and things like that into uh, the curriculum uh, in, in creative ways, because I know the creativity is out there. Uh, it just, you know, once you're used to the, to the new requirements, it's time to start uh, uh, taking up uh, the challenge of making it uh, more interesting for you and for, and for the students. So, you know, as a, as a board member, I, that would be something I would try to encourage to the board. There is a growing consensus among parents that Bret Hart High School no longer serves 100% of the constituency as it once did. Would you, if elected to the BUSD board, be open to looking at a K-12 option, working with Bret Hart to prevent redundancy to improve education in our district? Casey, you can go first. I guess I did. I kind of feel that you have to be open to maybe all options. I mean, it's something that has to be discussed through everyone, through parents, through teachers, through schools, through the board. And that's just about my only comment on that. You kind of have to be open to all options. Whether it works or not, it's something that you all have to figure out, we all have to figure out. And Wayne, your 
interesting. Uh, you know, I, this is a this is a small district, and you know something like a K twelve option is would be represent a huge restructuring of what we have now. Uh, you know, this isn't a big enough school district that we could have uh, you know tucked over here in the corner a K twelve option and all the other options still being maintained. And that would really be a major undertaking. So it would be something that I would have to be convinced that it was absolutely necessary to do. And only after every other option had been explored. You know, uh, it's kind of like Bret Hart has, maybe has its own issues, but I don't want to jeopardize what we have here, which I think is excellent here in Vallecito, uh, to address problems at, at Bret Hart. Uh, now, one of the things that I have wondered about is, and I and I, I don't know how well this is this is managed within the district within Balcedo. I would like to know how our students do once they get to Bret Hart, how well they integrate into Bret Hart, uh, how well they perform. Uh, are are we teaching them well enough to perform well there? Uh, and maybe anecdotally, we have some good evidence that, that they, they may be doing very well, but. You know, and this is a scientist in me. I like some statistical analysis of, of their grades in comparison with their, their peers from, from Mark Twain and other schools. So you get an idea of, of really are we meeting the challenge that, that we have to get them prepared when they get to Bret Hart to be uh, performing at their, at their best. Um, as a board member, I think what I believe we're talking about is the charter school. Um, you know, there's there's ways of teaching, there's ways of doing things. I don't know if what we do here, um, I do know that I see a lot of those kids down at the high school, and it seems to me the Valcito kids really do well. I'll give you an example. I know that the typing skills, because the Bret Hart basketball varsity coach is Rucker, who I go in and see, and he always says they know they're ready way before any other student could. Um, I think the charter school, it's something to look at. It's, I think, you know, I was talking to one of our one community members about this, and he showed me a few things, John Hall, he showed me a few things, and couple things of doing different things at the school. And again, it goes back to what, what you said about challenging, about, about looking at other options of educating our kids. Um, there was a couple things that, they, that I saw, I mean, that, that John had showed that really was exciting. Um, don't know if we're going to do. But it's something as a board member maybe we should look into. I know in the last few board meetings, they're, they're talking about it. They're talking about it. Um, looking at different ways of, of educating our children. I mean, that's what we're doing. <laughs> we are educating these kids to move on into high school, and the high school doing the best that they can. And I believe, again, I have two kids who graduated out of there, um, and a lot of us do have. And I think that for Valacito Unis, I think they do an excellent job in getting them prepared to get to the next level. Um, Having that option of a charter school, we got declining enrollment going on. We have um, economic issues probably coming in the, well, we're already there. <laughs> um, it's coming more. Um, you know, can we afford um, in our budget to do this, to integrate with the high school? To do this, because that's what it's going to take. It's going to take a body of minds to do this. Um, and a lot of work to get to something like that. Can we get that? I don't know. It's something to look into. I'm not opposed. I'm not opposed to looking at it. But um, again, remember, our, I think our kids are pretty well prepared to get to high school, I feel, if not more. So, thank you. Right. And this one, I'm combining two questions that are related. As a board member, keeping in touch with school operations and personnel is critical. One, how do you plan to stay in touch with staff, parents, and community members? And two, how would you make sure you represent many parents rather than just a few? Yeah, we need to go first. The role of a board member, I think, is to 
represent the community. And to do that, I think the board not only has an obligation to maintain a lot of open communication within the school itself, but spend a lot of time with the parents. Go to parent club meetings, uh, site council meetings, uh, be available to parents. Uh, you know, I, 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 I'm not, I, I can say I'm not going to have you know, coffee clashes over at my house and invite all the parents over. But I, I do feel I, I, I would want to make myself as available as, as possible to the students, uh, excuse me, to the parents. Uh, and the same goes with the school. You know, I, I spend, uh, I sp have spent a lot of time in the school, uh, Avery and Hazel Fisher, uh, through my daughter. Uh, and, you know, I, I really appreciated those times. Uh, and it, to be honest, it got to the point where my daughter was just as soon as I wasn't there, but she's at I have heart now anyway, so. <laughs> I'm free. I'm a free agent. I can do whatever I want. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, I think the important thing is to, is to to be there as often as possible, uh, in no official capacity other than as a board member, just to listen to what people have to say. Okay. And Clayton, um, this is one of those things that my wife just loves because. I'm one of those guys who loves to talk. Um, and I don't have a problem with talking to anybody. Um, I, I was listening to the board members last night talking about going to a couple of classes, going to the lunches. I can't wait to go to lunch. I love going on those campuses. I love the kids. I love hanging out, seeing what's going on, how the teachers, I love the teachers. I know quite a few of them. Um, can't wait to get to Bookie's class. Um, it's, it's just, I don't have a problem with doing those things. I don't have a problem um, communicating. Um, I love listening to, if they have problems, or even if the, listen to the good things. Um, listening to the band at the board meeting last night was probably one of the coolest things I have heard. Um, it's, it's, that part of this job is right down my alley. My wife's going to hate it, but it's right down my alley. So, thank you. Casey. Um, I think it's really important to be involved in the schools, to go to classrooms, to, you know, lend aid, whatever you need to do in a classroom, just to sit and observe. Um, do extracurricular activities, any sporting events, field trips, whatever, you know, I don't have a full-time job, so I do have the advantage that I can give more time to go out to the school sites and to observe and be a part of that. And also to listen to parents, you know, if, if somebody wants to talk to you, that's what my job is to represent the kids and the parents. So I'd hope they feel free to come and ask me any questions because uh, obviously, I have a lot to learn, but I think that's all part of this process. And you know, hopefully, they'll feel comfortable to talk to me because I would like to be more involved. We have time for about two more rounds of questions, so go for it. I'm sure if they don't all get asked, the candidates will be here afterwards. If any individuals want to talk to you, we have time for two more rounds. So Mr. Davis, was there a single teacher in your past? who made a real difference in your life? If so, please elaborate. Okay. You go first. <laughs> All right, get a little emotional here. Um, Mr. Valdez, little, little pudgy Cuban guy. And if we're talking about here, we're talking about anybody <coughs> here. here or in my life, little big, a little Cuban guy, Mr. Valdez, my geometry teacher, uh, made a huge difference. Um, wasn't the best student, was pretty good at math, but I felt pretty good about um, what he had done. Here, um, it's interesting. I am um, going through all Michelson, um, and I just talked to him about this here not too long ago. It has to be booky. Um, and because what he did with my girl. So, um, you know, he was, they'd come home and they'd say, 
God, Pookie, he's great. You talk about this subject, and next thing you know, he's going on a tangent. He's going crazy. He's like, and he'll forget about what he needs to do. What a great teacher to have, to be able to go and still stay in curriculum. Because I talked to him about this. He says, Clayton, they have no idea that I do it on purpose. <laughs> that's, that's a teacher that, that, you know, I think I want my kids, and I think every kid should go through. Not saying they shouldn't go through it, but of course it does. Everybody knows it does here. <laughs> so, um, you know, I just think that uh, for myself, Boogie, and a you know, little, little exiled Cuban back in Andrew Hill at, at um, San Jose was probably a big thing for me. Thank you. Casey? Um, uh, immediate teacher was came to mind to me is Jan Schultz at Bret Hart. He was the toughest teacher I ever <coughs> had, but I learned the most in his classroom. He just had a way. I mean, he was an amazing teacher, and he stuck with you because he was really hard. But it, you really learned in his classroom. I, I wrote down a bunch of notes on three by five cards preparing for this, and as I was putting them together, I looked at him. I thought, "What would Mrs. Ercolini say about my handwriting?" <laughs> <laughs> Alice Ercolini was my second grade teacher at. Uh, Francis Scott Key School in San Francisco. She was my mother's first grade teacher. Wow. So, you know, I, I, I caught her at the tail end of her career. She was a big, big husky woman who was very strict, very strict, old school teacher. She instilled a love for science in me that I carried through my whole life. Um, she was wonderful. She was the only teacher that I kept in contact with uh, after I moved out of the area. Uh, my, my mother and I would go back to see her frequently uh, in retirement. Um, she was not above grading papers, calling you up one at a time to stand in front of the class while she told the class how bad you were on your paper. <laughs> uh, and what stupid mistakes, no, stupid, but what, what mistakes she made. Uh, second was uh, uh, John Criscow, my English teacher in Crestmore High School. Um, I have never had a teacher who wanted to unleash creativity in students before. Uh, and he had all sorts of wonderful ways of doing it. Uh, uh, he had us doing uh, extemporaneous poetry uh, on stage before a microphone in front of the whole class, making up poetry just on, off the He'd throw out a topic and we'd make a poem of it. Uh, fantastic, fantastic teacher. Uh, and I, I guess I, I would like to throw out a local one too because uh, this is a person who really uh, made me feel so good about my daughter being in the Alcido Union School, Union School District, and that is Sue King. Um, and uh, I, I always wanted to say this to her. I never had a chance to, but uh, we see each other quite a bit. One of the things that's always impressed me about Sue reminds me of a line from uh, Child's Christmas in Wales. I don't know if you're familiar with it. It's a, it's a story by, uh, um, help me out here, Dylan Thomas. Dylan Thomas, thank you. Uh, and it's a series of stories, his remembrances from, from uh, Christmas. And then the first story, he and his friend uh, hear the fire bell going off, and there's a fire in his, in his friend's house in the living room, and they're off playing in the snow. They run in with their snowballs. There's smoke all over. They throw the smoke, throw snowballs into the smoke. The firemen come. It's a big mess. Finally, everything's done, and Jim, his friend's uh, maiden aunt, walks down the stairs, and they wait very patiently to listen to what she says, because and this is what reminds me of Sue King because she says the right thing always. So. In what area or areas are your strengths? Budget, curriculum, negotiations, facilities, and how did you get your knowledge about that area? I'm sorry, one more time. 
In what area or areas are your strengths? Budget, curriculum, negotiations, facilities. And how did you get your knowledge about that area? Okay. Um, <coughs> well, my strengths really don't have to do with the school system. My strengths are people skills, I feel. Um, I've been in business for many years. I've lived here most of my life. I know a lot of people. And, and I think communication is probably my biggest strength. Okay. And Wayne, you're next. Uh, you know, I've, I've been up here, as I said, for 25 years. And for virtually that whole time, uh, the program I manage in State Parks, the Resource Management Program, has had a very small, little permanent budget. Uh, not nearly enough to, to pay for 13 staff members. And so every year I go through the process of trying to get money together for next year. And I think I've been very successful at it. My budget for this coming year, uh, not counting permanent salaries like my own, is about $600,000. Uh, and it usually is in the four to $600,000 range. And that's all money that I have to scramble for every year. Uh, so I think uh, from the standpoint of budgeting, I understand the process very well and uh, having to make decisions on budgets that may be tough, uh, but also being creative and being able to, to get money. The second one that I think I have to offer is not one that was necessarily offered as an alternative, but uh, you know, I'm an environmental scientist, to be honest with you. you know, I went to college and I graduated in 1970. There are a lot of environmental scientists who work for state parks who are much better botanists than I am, much better wildlife biologists, uh, much better hydrologists, much better ecologist than I am, but what I think I really offer the department has been, and is something that the department has made use of, not just locally but statewide, is I think my ability to, to be a problem solver, to, to be creatively analyze problems and come up with unique solutions that, uh, that need them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, one of the, the things that I've been on for 10 years now is AMA boosters. And uh, we, every year, have to budget our sports, which we have football, um, volleyball, um, we have a, just a, a, an array of wrestling, um, and we have to run our budgets. Um, we do very well at it. We, um, every year we have a budget meeting, um, and we try to stick with our budget throughout the whole year. I mean, we encompass the whole Highway 4 corridor. We are the, the parks and rec, besides soccer, of um, the Highway 4 corridor. And we, there's nine of us, and we're all involved in some way, but we all come together, and we budget our, our club. Um, I've gone to the board meetings. Um, it's funny, Ralph said something last night about the candidates are going to be here till 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, and I remember those budget meetings or those <coughs> meetings where they talk about the budget. Um, it's long. It's one of those things. I understand somewhat how the school works, um, how, how they have to go through the rip wars, the, um, the Stuff that they got to do to the budget. I don't know the exact, but you know that's what what you get on the board. You learn about those things. Um, I run my own business, um, and the other one is communication. Probably one of the biggest ones for me is I'm up and down the highway <coughs> corridor, whether from coaching my business, um, coaching and or my business. I see from from Big Tree, um, from Dorrington all the way down. You know, I have jobs in Angels. Murphy's, Arnold. I see a lot of people in my travels. Um, some people ask if I even work, correct? Um, and uh, those are some of the things that I do personally, that I think I do well at, is communicating. Um, being able to make those decisions um, on a board. I've been on, like I said, the AMA board, the Feeney Park I've been on um, when it first started. Decisions that we had to make with Feeney, uh, decisions we had to make um, in just everyday life, my business, <coughs> AMA board, those are some of my, my things that we uh, 
um, that I give. Well, I want to thank the audience for your questions. They were very thoughtful, and I thought it was great. They clearly had the students' best interest at heart, so you did a great job with your questions. Um, at this time, each candidate will have up to two minutes for a closing statement, and so I put the things back in here, and I'll just pull one out. The first one to get to go will be Casey. Okay. Uh, well, obviously, I don't have the experience that these gentlemen have. Um, but I think I offer a fresh face. I have no agenda. I'm somebody who likes a challenge. I like to work hard. And I really care about this community. Lived here a long time, been through the system, know a lot of people. And I would just like to be involved in the future of our schools and our children. Thank you. somewhere else, my father-in-law's place. Um, people came to, um, it was the most amazing thing. People came and took our clothes, took our stuff, and next thing you know, we're getting it washed and bringing it back. In sounds like where we lived before, that wouldn't have happened. And what I'm trying to get at is the fact that this community is great. This community is something that when that happened for my wife and I, we decided from that day, from Literally, from that day, we were going to be help in this community. It was something we never had seen before. Of course, we're a young couple, but it was something that we were going to do. We were going to help in this community from chicken in the barrel to sports boosters clubs when we didn't have money here before the bond to three-on-three -three tournaments to giving Bookie a ream of paper or however much paper um, to whatever it took to do, being on that side of that board and giving them <coughs> their thing. <laughs> and now, it's now it's my time to be on this side, to help the community. We are the gatekeeper. We are it for the community to make sure our schools are running well, our kids have the best education that, they, that we can, to, to their uh, health and welfare, everything. That's the part that now I'm ready to do. People have asked me, you know, why do you want to do this? Well, what's in it? You don't have kids there. <laughs> well, you know what? I've done all the parent thing. I've done it probably overboard. Now it's time to be on this side, do what we can, do what I can for the community, for the people of the community, the kids, to make sure the kids have every possible means of education, health, and the welfare that we can. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've, I've done the parent thing, and uh, now my daughter's at Bret Hart. She graduated, and, and I didn't. I didn't graduate from the school district yet. I still feel like I want to be involved in it. It's still where I have a strong commitment. I have strong ties with many of you. I have strong ties with the children, even the ones that I haven't met yet. You know, I realized uh, uh, I enjoyed working with my in my daughter's classes early on when she first started, but uh, I had an opportunity one time to be in a class after she had gone on to another grade, uh, working with little kids. Uh, and I had this one little boy whose name will remain nameless, uh, who uh, I was working with, and he looked at, at me, and it's more like this. <laughs> and he said, do you know my name? I said, yes, I know your name, and I mentioned it. He said, I said, do you know my name? And he looked at, at me, and he said, yeah, you're Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> and that meant so much to me. <laughs> uh, it, it really did. It, it just made me feel so good uh, that uh, he recognized the resemblance, I guess. I <laughs> but it made me feel very special. 
and made me realize that uh, being involved in the school was more than just being involved in my daughter's education, but being involved in the entire educational process. And uh, I just want to continue with that uh, and uh, uh, do what I can for the kids of this community.